Um, I'm going to be talking about a novel robotics <coughs> platform for transurethral surgery. Um, Important disclosure for me, I am a co-investigator on an NIH R01 looking at this technology for natural orifice uh, radical prostatectomy. We've seen a significant evolution from open surgery to minimally invasive surgery, finally to robotic surgery. Um, and I think we can say that this, um, this progression really is as significant um, as the discovery of anesthesia in terms of improving outcomes for patients. Robotics has allowed the challenges of complex laparoscopic surgery like partial nephrectomy um, to be available to every surgeon and every patient. Um, it really takes some complex skills um, and uses technology um, to get us all on an even playing field um, for these complex operations. What does robotics allow? It allows significant increase in, de uh, in our degrees of freedom, which translate to an increase in dexterity, there being six degrees of freedom as shown here. We also have noticed significant improvement in the ability to suture laparoscopic surgery compared to robotic surgery. In addition, robotics allows you to have multiple arms for retraction, suction, uh, and again to assist in suturing. So it's really revolutionized um, minimally invasive surgery. Well, advances have not just been made. Um, in you know this type of robotic surgery, the Da Vinci robot is not the only robot that there is. There's been significant advances in flexible robotics. Um, Bloomberg Business Week said robots could replace surgeons in the battle against cancer. The Oris Monarch robot has been predominantly used for um, lung cancer thus far, but there are significant uh, potentials for this in the uh, gender urinary space as well. And then our own Dr. Rossweiler has a lot of experience with the uh, Turkish Roboflex <coughs> Avicenna robot um, and has actually been said, I'll never go back to normal because this is the future. This is a robot that drives a flexible ureteroscope up into the kidney to allow extremely precise movements for treating kidney stones. Well, what about rigid endoscopic surgery? We don't always think about robotics in this setting. There are significant limitations to, uh, to our work in, uh, with rigid endoscopes. We have essentially three degrees of freedom. We would like to have six. Here's an example of, uh, this is brain surgery actually. Um, this is an endoscopic uh, brain surgery excision of a cyst. The surgeon here is using a laparoscopic instrument, wants to make a cut, but you can see that without being able to rotate the instrument, you could easily get into that very large blood vessel that's uh, pulsating there. So what if we were to completely reimagine what's possible for transurethral surgery? I don't know how many of you are familiar with John Wickham, but he is a very famous uh, British urologist. He developed, among many other things, um, the first uh, robotic, it's called the ProBot, first robot for TURP. This was an autonomous robot that would actually go and perform the operation. Um, so the problem with this is that it was too expensive uh, to manufacture, and so I think Dr. Wickham was well ahead of his time. Uh, at the Vanderbilt, at Vanderbilt we're incredibly lucky. We have something called the Institute for Surgery and Engineering. It combines the engineering of biomedical, electrical, and mechanical with all of the clinical enterprises you see there. It's $27 million in research funding, has the ability to create spin-off companies from the technology that's developed in the labs, as well as IP and, and specific devices. I'm very lucky to be able to work with this group of investigators. One in particular is Bob Webster. Um, he developed what, what the concept of concentric tube robots. Concentric tube robots are essentially pre-curved elastic tubes that are nested inside of each other. And then there's a very complex mathematical algorithms that, that, that are put into a computer that allow these, um, these robotic tubes to move in and out of each other. Um, I'm going to show you. It actually moves in almost like a tentacle-like motion. And so you might say to yourself, okay, well, you know, how could that actually be helpful in transurethral surgery? Well, this is what's helpful. 
That's standard robotic instrument. This is how small we can get these concentric tubes. We can get them incredibly small and miniaturize them so that we could actually use them through a standard endoscope. So this, um, this technology that was developed in the engineering lab um, at Vanderbilt was then used to apply for an SBIR grant for a startup company called Virtuoso Surgical. I have no financial interest in this company. But their concept was, can we develop a conventional endoscope with two needle-sized robotic arms? Think about what the potentials could be. You could use a scissor, a laser fiber, a suction irrigator, forceps, countless number of instruments simultaneously and therefore allowing complex two-handed um, maneuvers in really the tiniest spaces in the body. So this is the, uh, a cartoon, if you will, of what we imagined this could be. Um, cartoons are great, uh, but taking them from cartoon to reality is a whole other story. Um, but again, these are 1.5 millimeter instruments. Uh, through a standard endoscope. When we first uh, um, conceptualized it, we thought about it as having the surgeon joysticks at, uh, at the back side of this, but I'll show you how the development, how this has gone forward. So that was the, what we conceptualized, and this was really one of the very first prototypes. Um, again, now you're seeing uh, it's got removable cartridges, so those would be disposable. So if you want to put your laser fiber or your basket or whatever, um, you would be able to, to load those. This is a standard 26 French outer sheath resectoscope, inner sheath. Everything else would be something you'd already have in your operating room. Okay, if you look at that, you think, gosh, that would be really heavy. <laughs> How on earth would you keep that in a patient's urethra? Um, and so we needed something that would be able to hold the instrument. So this is called the KUKA robot. It's a German medical grade robot um, that essentially, it's not functioning autonomously. All it's doing is actually counterbalancing the weight um, of, the, of the robotic um, uh, portion that's in the urethra. So here is the system, again, sort of how we would envision it uh, being when it's completely developed. Um, and now you can see that the surgeon input console has been moved away from the patient. Again, much like the Avicenna, you're going to be away from the patient. You can be, you know, you can really put it anywhere you want. Um, but I think in that way, it's a lot more like some of the robots that we're used to using. So again, that's a that's a cartoon. But this is what we have right now. Uh, we've taken every prototype of this and named them after composers. This is the Bach. Um, and so you can see that, you know, to some degree, it's starting very much to look like what we're imagining. Um, and again, what we're trying to do um, is all sorts of preclinical studies to see what the potential is for this um, instrumentation. So what could be the clinical utility? We've been talking about potential use for prostate, um, for bladder. Um, but if you think about all the small spaces in the body, there's probably endless clinical potential uh, for this technology. What is the surgical value proposition? Well, I'm a surgeon that uh, spends a lot of my time doing laser nucleation. And one of the biggest um, you know, downsides, if you will, to the adoption of this technique has been cited to be the learning curve. Well, that's one of the reasons I was you know, essentially brought into this um, research in the first place, was could we use this instrumentation to improve um, and shorten the learning curve for laser nucleation? There's also been an increasing interest in end block resection for bladder tumors. Um, so we think that this could, uh, this technology could really be used in that space where you'd be able to have something to grab the tumor and then another instrument to actually complete the end block resection. Leaving urology a little bit and going into uh, gynecology, the gynecologists remove a lot of uh, uterine polyps. And so it's much like a bladder uh, tumor. And so we think there might be potential there as well um, with being able to do end block resection of um, uterine uh, polyps. As I mentioned, there, um, particularly with the thulium laser, there's been a lot of increasing interest in improving our pathological specimens um, for uh, bladder cancer uh, using the thulium uh, laser and end block resection. This is today how we take care of bladder tumors. 
you can see, you know, every bladder tumor is different. Some will resect very easily, some uh, will not, and you're taking it out in pieces. This is not a bladder tumor. This is a um, uterine polyp, but you can see this is our, this is our uh, transurethral robot working um, inside with the two arms. And again, these are very uh, primitive instruments so far, uh, but you can see how the, ability, the, the benefit of being able to retract and push things out of the way may very well be able to uh, improve not only our time of resection, but the quality of our specimens. Same thing here. This is how a conventional uh, uterine polyp is cut out. I'm so glad I'm not a gynecologist because this looks incredibly, you know, primitive to me. What instrument you're, you're cutting. Uh, again, you've seen this video, what we think we can do. Uh, another thing that happens in gynecology, apparently a lot, I didn't know this, but there's a lot of retained IUDs. Um, so here is a video of us using this instrumentation to remove one of these uh, IUDs. So you can have pretty precise uh, movements. And I just think the idea of having two working arms transurethrally is really going to be a game changer. Okay, so I'm going to open Pandora's box um, and, and just have you think a little bit about natural orifice transluminal endoscopic radical prostatectomy. Um, so this has already been reported by Mitch Humphreys. He and I were fellows together and, um, under Dr. Lingaman. Um, and in 2012, they, des they described a small patient series of notes, radical prostatectomy. The biggest problem they had was that the instrumentation for performing the sutured anastomosis was problematic. So that brings us to the basis of our R01 funding. So this is what we would like, we envision we may be able to do. Again, a cartoon, but I think um, it, it gets to the point of what we think that having the two arms would be really useful. Um, so you could put your VLOC suture, drop it in the bladder, and then have your other arm with a needle driver, which then is able to grasp the urethra as well as the bladder, and you can have a grasper in your other hand and pull the bladder to you, um, and then be able to put the needle driver through, feed the suture, um, potential basket, a grasper, there's a whole variety of instruments we could use in this uh, circumstance, grab it to yourself, and then pull it through um, the tissue and be able to, to potentially do the urethral anastomosis in, a, um, in a, a very efficient way. Just let you show. And that's why the VLOC I think is incredibly useful because you don't have to tie a knot there. So that, um, this uh, RO1, uh, the, the primary investigators are Bob Webster and my partner Duke Harrell. Um, I'm co-investigator on this RO1 and it's uh, funded with $2.1 million to develop this technology. Um, I would say that, you know, uh, Dr. Flynn and I talked a lot uh, at a prior lecture that I gave that potentially there is a role for this robot in reconstructive urethral surgery as well. Um, I just don't have any uh, data to show that on that. So I think that in the end, we need to innovate or die. Clearly, we don't want to be replaced by robotic physicians. Um, but I think that uh, Abraham Lincoln had it right. The most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. And that's certainly what we're trying to do at Vanderbilt. Um, if anyone has any um, questions about this technology or interest in it further, please um, find me. And I'm happy to talk to you about it. Thank you so much for your time.